Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Yarek Langer. I am a second year MBA student at MIT Sloan and part of the research papers team for the conference. Um, it is my pleasure today to introduce to you uh, Jeff Sackman, who will be talking about the advent of actionable tennis analytics. Um, a couple of things just on a technical note. So first of all, if you could just please silence all your cell phones so we don't have any interruptions. And secondly, um, the presentation will be about 20 minutes long. We'll do a five minute Q&A afterwards. Um, just please raise your hand and I'll try to get you the mic and please speak loudly and clearly in the mic so everyone can hear the question. Uh, with that, it is my pleasure to introduce to you uh, Jeff Sackman. Thanks everybody. Can everybody hear me okay? Feels like I'm coming through the mic. All right. All right, thanks for coming, and thank you to um, Dave Jacobs, whole team at Sloan for making this happen, Carl Bialik also for helping make this happen. Really glad to be here. What I'm talking about is the advent of actionable tennis analytics. Basically, tennis analytics lags behind pretty much every other sport you've heard anything about so far at Sloan. Not a lot of data out there, not a lot of work being done with the data, um, especially in the department of actually something that players on the court can use. There's a lot being done for betters and you know, just general fun and analytics, but not a lot that players can take advantage of and, you know, earn more points, win more matches, that kind of thing. So what I'm going to talk about is in three parts today. First, I'm going to talk about the star, sorry state of tennis data. What's the problem? Um, is it possible to fix it? Maybe. Um, then I'm going to talk about two things that we can actually do with the data that's out there. First, we're going to talk about the potential of schedule optimization, uh, how players can benefit from choosing the right tournaments, playing in the right places at the right time. And finally, I'm going to talk about the match charting project, which is a project of mine to help improve the state of tennis data. So first off, the sorry state of tennis data. There's a lot of cooks in the kitchen, and there aren't even any plates. Lots of people out there who are collecting some data, um, but not any who are really giving it to anyone who can use it. So let's talk a little bit about what's out there, what we have to work with as, um, as tennis analysts and researchers. There's four parts. I'm going to show you some examples of each of them in a second. But the basic stuff you see on um, tennis broadcasts is really simple match stats, just aces, first serve points, one, break points, stuff like that. And, it's pretty limited. It's what commentators talk about because it's all they have. The next step beyond that, we have umpire scorecards. If you ever see an umpire sitting up in their chair during a match and they're tapping away on a little screen, this is what they're doing. They're tracking things like first, second serves, aces, double faults, and it does record the sequence of points, which as we'll see is, is pretty helpful. IBM does some point by point data um, during Grand Slams. This is a lot better, um, but it's pretty limited. Uh, and then finally, there's Hawkeye data, which we're going to talk about more later. It's great, amazing stuff, but most of us don't ever get to see any of it. Those of us who do only get to see a little piece of it for other reasons we'll talk about later. So first off, we have match stats. Some really basic numbers, some percentages on things like aces, double faults, first serves. Stuff you could tally with you know, a bunch of little marks on a sheet of paper during a match. Not complicated, not all that useful. We can do f some fun stuff with it, but we're talking about kindergarten in terms of analytics compared to the things that are happening in other sports. Unfortunately, when all you have is match stats, everything looks like a problem you can't solve with match stats. So if you listen to commentators during a tennis match, you hear a lot about these numbers. Why? Because those are the numbers they have, and those are the only numbers they have. So we need to improve on that. What's also out there, as I mentioned, umpire scorecards. This is from a Davis Cup match several years ago, and it looks pretty primitive, and it is. Like I said, this is what happens when umpires are tapping away. But um, What's nice about it is we have point sequencing. So if you want to know, if you want to answer questions about like clutch play, who's doing well in, in important points, um, who's getting their first serves in in important points, it's useful stuff since we have the order of all the points. Unfortunately, there are very few scorecards out there for researchers. It would be so easy for uh, tennis tours to do it, but they don't. Um, coming back to IBM point by point stuff, this is only during Grand Slams, not even every match during Grand Slams, but they are hooked up to the Hawkeye cameras. So we have some stats on things like serve speed, um, number of winners, directions of winners, some cool stuff, but again, not really available for researchers, not available for every match. And finally, we have Hawkeye. This is, this is the real cool cutting edge stuff. These are the sort of people we probably should be talking at Sloan. Uh, <laughs> but you can see all the great stuff they can do during broadcasts. You can get all these cool maps of where players are hitting the ball from, what angle they're hitting it at, the sort of trajectory on the ball all kinds of stuff, but, um, but we don't really get that, you know, plebeians like myself. So we have a complete list of public APIs offered by tennis tours, tournaments, and federations. That is not a mistake, that is an empty list. All the things we were talking about, not available to the public in any usable form. So people like me get to do a lot of scraping. When I say a lot of scraping, I don't think you understood me. I meant a lot 
of scraping. So why is there so little engagement? Why is tennis lagging behind other sports? And there's a few reasons. First of all, the tennis world is fragmented. You know, we've been hearing this weekend from commissioners, like from soccer and baseball, and those people have the power to like, really make some things happen. And baseball has really led the way in that department. Tennis has a bunch of little things going on. So imagine if instead of Rob Manfred, baseball had the president of the American League, president of the National League, president of the World Series, president of the Subway Series, and the guy who ran the Subway Series also had some control over some of Little League and short season A ball. That's tennis. And uh, it's kind of tough to have some overarching like, data initiative when you have all these little pieces and most of the presidents aren't interested in growing the sport in, for everyone's benefit. They're really more interested in getting more money from their Rolex sponsorship. Didn't mean to go on so far. I just th thought I had a zinger there, so I wanted to hit the button. <laughs> um, Second point there is individual sports just aren't as, as, as given to analytics. I mean, if you're talking about baseball or basketball or something like that, you need to tease out individual player contribution. If you're watching a Roger Federer match, it's not hard to tease out the individual player contribution. If Roger Federer won, it's probably because Roger Federer played well that day. I mean, it, there's a little more to the story than that, but there just isn't as much work that needs to be done in an obvious way. There's no general managers who are out there trying to solve these problems because there's no general managers, period. And finally, the existing analytics have been developed largely for betters. That's who the market is. Because there's no market in the game, besides just a few exceptions, um, the market are people who bet on sports. You can make a lot of money, um, sometimes by paying players to tank matches, um, but also by studying the game and working with analytics. So enough whining. I'm done with that. I'm not entirely done. I'll come back to whining a little bit later, but for now we're done. So the question is, what can we do with what we have? I'm more interested in that than complaining all the time. So that moves us on to the potential of schedule optimization. The stakes are really high. People's careers are at stake. Ranking points, prize money, they not only determine how successful a player is, but whether they can keep playing, whether they can even get into the tournaments that, that have the highest stakes. So the main point here is that not all events are created equal. If you qualify for a Grand Slam or for a big Masters event or something, like, you pretty much have to play. There's no choice there. But several weeks of the year, every player has a choice. Do I play? Do I go to a small, small tournament where I'll be a top player? Do I go to a big tournament where the stakes are higher, but I might be a smaller fish? The lower tier players are the ones who have the biggest decisions to make and who can benefit from this the most. And amazingly, given the state of tennis analytics, there are a couple players out there who are already doing this. So it's exciting this is actually something that's happening in tennis analytics. So a quick case study. This is something that I wrote about on my blog, Heavy Topsman, last summer. There are two events in the WTA summer circuit, one in Stanford, one in Washington, DC. Same week, same surface, same country, a great natural experiment. The only difference is Stanford is a premier event, so the winner gets 470 ranking points, 120 grand. Washington, DC is a smaller event, not nearly as many ranking points, way less money. So let's look at one player's decisions here. It says Lucy Safarova. That's not how you say her last name since she's Czech, but that's how I'm going to say it. At this point last year, she was ranked number 17 in the world. If she went to DC, she would be the top seed. Clear tournament favorite to win. If she went to Stanford, she'd be the number eight seed. She'd be likely to face, after only two matches, possibly Serena Williams, Agnieszka Radwanska, one of the top players in the world. Let's look at her, at her chances. Just a basic approximation. If she went to Washington, she'd have a 14% chance of winning the title. Pretty good, better than anybody else. If she went to Stanford, 3% chance of winning the title. Very high chance of losing in the quarterfinals. Not so good. So, quick show of hands. Who goes with Washington? Who goes with Stanford? All right. There you go. There are your results. Go to Washington. Points are about the same, 87 to 95. Look at the prize money. Everybody who chose to go to Washington, you just gave up 10 grand. Nice work. I'd like to make some bets with you later. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, Lucy didn't do too well that week. She lost in the first round. She got one point and two grand, so it didn't really matter. But you see the point here. <laughs> when the stakes are higher, that's where the real rewards are, especially for someone in Safarova's case. And it turns out that that's true for most players. So the big picture for everyone who entered those two events, 48 direct entrants, most of whom could have chosen between the two events, 48 would have made more prize money. Every single player would have made more money going to the bigger event. 37 of the 48 would have gotten more ranking points going to the bigger event. The only exceptions, and this is really important, are the ones who would get a seed, basically have their draw protected in Washington, D.C., but wouldn't have in Stanford. In Safarova's case, she would have had the seed in both places. So she would have been at least mildly protected even at the bigger tournament. So one example, the second seed in D.C., who ended up making the final, um, she's one of those players. She had one of the bigger gaps in favor of Washington, D.C., uh, 
because she had that protected seat in DC, but she would have been unseated in Sanford. She could have drawn Serena Williams in the first round. Not really what you want to do. So the even bigger picture, as I said, seeds matter. Probably didn't need somebody standing up here and telling you about that. But here are the basic rules, like I just said. If you're going to be seated in one place and not in the other place, go where you get the seed. In any other circumstances, seed in both places, unseed in both places, go where the rewards are greater. It's, there's exceptions to every rule, but it's pretty much that simple. And as we've seen, there are some cases where ranking points and prize money differ. So if you have to choose between more ranking points or more prize money, what do you do? Personally, I'd go with the prize money, but it turns out that for tennis players, ranking points are a bigger deal. And the reason why is the long-term decision. I mean, if you need to pay your airfare to get to the next place or get home, maybe prize money is a good deal. But if you want to build a career, then short-term points get you into more tournaments, they get you more seeds in those tournaments, and they get you more prize money and ranking points in the long term. So you need those ranking points to improve your odds moving forward. Here's a quick example. These are the number 32 and number 33 players in the world going into this year's Australian Open. Um, Bencich had the 32 seeds, so her draw was protected. Madison Keys wasn't. Those of you who follow tennis know that this is not the best example I could come up with because Keys ended up making the semifinal anyway. But if we look at the pre-tournament odds, Keys did well, but before the draw was made, before it was determined who exactly would play who, Benchitz, purely because of her seed, only because of her seed, not because of her talent or skill or anything else, had I mean, a much better chance of making the third round and going deeper in the tournament than Keys did, simply because of the way the draw was made. That's how much rankings matter. That's the potential stakes of these of these week-to-week -week decisions that players are making. Couple wrinkles I want to talk about. One is when buys are involved, you want to go with a buy. If you can get a free pass to the second round, it's even better than a seed in most places. Um, also, you can't tell the draw entirely in advance. You don't know who exactly is going to show up any given week. So. If that guy, Rafael Nadal, is gonna suddenly turn up, then the math changes a lot. And when I did a similar study on this with a couple men's tournaments back in 2013, Nadal totally screwed the whole thing up. Um, the whole bigger stakes is a better deal. Well, bigger stakes are a better deal unless you might play Rafael Nadal on clay for the bigger stakes. If, if that happens, then, um, then, yeah, it turns out predicting the future is hard. That's what this slide is about. You didn't know that. So yeah, Nadal breaks every model, but in, in general, in the, these rules hold. A couple other additional considerations. There are reasons that players would make suboptimal choices. They might need to go to a tournament because of a sponsor. They might be getting some appearance fees just for showing up. They might really like an event for some reason. They might you know, care more about their doubles schedule. You know, tons of reasons, but basically, that's how players should optimize their schedule. So we've talked about where to play. Now the big stuff, how to play. And this is still in its infancy. But this is the match charting project. This is my initiative to start gathering data to essentially replace, kind of, a little bit, the Hawkeye data that Hawkeye won't let us have. So the problem is that there's all this amazing data out there, and we can't have it. Now, some researchers managed to get their hands on a little bit, but there's this giant data set that exists in at least somebody's mind that nobody gets to study. So we're working on something else. Uh, turns out whining about it doesn't help. We've discovered that earlier in this presentation. It's not gonna help anytime soon, so this is our substitution. Crowdsource charting. Um, lots of fans watch a lot of tennis, especially me. Um, lots of fans want ten better tennis stats, also, especially me. Um, so a fan in a spreadsheet, it's not enough to replicate Hawkeye data, but it'll get us some of the way, and it'll help us do, answer a lot of the questions that Hawkeye data otherwise would have helped us answer. So I wanna walk you through how this project works a little bit and, and sh eventually show you some of the early findings. This is what the spreadsheet looks like. The stuff in yellow is all that people have to do when they're charting matches live. It's just a string of characters. Every character stands for either the type of shot or the direction of the shot. So what we're seeing here is for every serve, what direction are they hitting it? Wide serve, T serve, down the middle. Returns, what direction, how deep is it, what kind of shot. Every shot, what direction, uh, what kind of shot, and then is it a winner, unforced error, forced error, all that stuff. Tons of data just from that string of characters, and it turns out we can do a huge amount of analysis just based on something so simple, even if we don't have pretty pictures, because we definitely don't have pretty pictures, as you can tell. Um, what we have so far, uh, a lot of people have helped out. We've got over 30 people contributing, uh, two-thirds of the way to 1,000 matches, hundreds of different players. Tons of great data, especially on a few key players that we're gonna see later. So there are a few players who we have over 60 matches on, which really allows us to drill into the, the nature of their game. 
So just some sample of what we can find here. This is, this is just about Djokovic's returns in one match to give you an idea of how much data we can generate from just a simple spreadsheet. This is you know, in every, every conceivable permutation of scores in terms of um, type of serve, type of, um, type of first serve, second serve, deuce course, add court, how often are the, serve, are the returns going in, how deep are they going, you know, on and on, tons of data. And also because we have so much data on people like Djokovic and Nadal, we can put it all in context. Tons of numbers, they don't mean a lot to, the, to really anybody because there's so many of them and these are all new stats, but we can put it in context so we can see that you know, in this match Djokovic was hitting more deep returns or he was hitting more returns in play from the deuce side and so on. Uh, same thing with types of shots, success rate on every type of shot in a match and just for kicks we have a full text recap of the entire match that you can generate just from, from those characters typing into the spreadsheet. So I just want to give you a quick sample of some of the player tendencies that we can establish from this sort of data. So let's take, for example, a first serve in the ad court. Uh, we're only going to talk about matches between right-handers and right-handers because it gets complicated when you work lefties into the mix. So as it turns out, this is all based on my WTA data for women's tennis. Wide serves and T serves are better than serves down the middle. Big surprise, right? You want to hit it away from the player. So it turns out people don't get nearly as many serves back if they're hit in either corner of the service box. Um, point results are way better. You win a lot more points as a server if you can hit the serve away from the player's body. Again, big surprise. It looks like a weapon when someone hits a serve like that. That's Karolina Pliskova hitting a, a really nice tee serve up the middle. Um, Simona Halep is, is lunging for it. Looks like probably Pliskova is about to win the point if Halep even gets it back at all. Haha, <laughs> but not against Simona Halep. Uh, <laughs> as you can see from the close up, uh, you can really only see the same thing. But with Halep, she gets the same sort of distribution of returns in play. She gets way more returns in play if you hit it right at her. Big surprise. But the end result's very different. If she gets that middle serve, this T serve back, then she's way more successful. She's almost as successful in those points as she is with serves that are hit right to her body. So she essentially neutralizes that weapon. is very confident in that up the T serve, as she should be because it's great. But against Halep, it wasn't a very effective tactic. Probably wouldn't have made the difference when she lost to Halep the other day, but uh, it might have helped. And as I did note there, Halep did win that point. Took about eight shots, but, but she won it. So to dig just a little deeper, uh, I did a little more analysis of just one specific type of shot in the middle of a rally. So to categorize every shot, I just categorize where it's being hit from, the type of shot, and where it's being hit to. So for instance, a forehand cross court. It's being hit from this corner. It's being hit as a forehand. It's being hit cross court to that corner. So, how are players responding to that kind of shot? This is one of 12 possible common permutations. And we get to see the six players who I have the best data for in the women's tennis database. Here's what happens. Um, again, these are numbers that are a little bit difficult to understand without any context. But if you look, look at what happens when someone responds to a cross court forehand. So for instance, our average, if you respond and hit it cross, you hit it cross court 37% of the time, hit it up the middle 28% of the time, eventually, you win the point 66% of the time, responding to a cross-court forehand. It, these all numbers are all at well above 50% because the next person could, you know, you could hit a winner, the person could return with an unforced error. So you have an edge every time you get a ball in play. But there's big differences here. You can see if you, ret if you return a cross-court forehand with a shot down the line, um, you know, Sharapova does that way more often than most other players do. As Rankin and Sharapova are over 40%, Serena Williams is under 28%. Serena hits way more cross-court shots back cross-court. So you need to have different tactics against those different players. And that's the kind of data that without aggregate information, rather than just a small sample from one tournament or from one player, you're just not gonna have those answers. So, like I said, just a sample of the data, there's 12 other permutations of shots like that. Um, it would be really interesting to dive into any cell in that table to see, okay, well, Serena hits a cross-court forehand. How good is it? How many winners is she hitting? How often is she forcing an error? How often is she causing an unforced error? What happens from there? We could build some super fun Markov chains and stay here for another few hours, which I'd love to do. I don't, is anybody else up for that? <laughs> no? No, it's clear that it's, it's not gonna happen that way. Um, so this is why having a tour-wide data set is so important, that it, we need to have the context. These numbers are absolutely meaningless without the context. And if you look at any tennis broadcast, you see lots of numbers like this, and they're completely context-free. Uh, 667 matches is actually just a drop in the bucket, but it's huge compared to the context that most tennis fans are getting most of the time. So, like I said, it's not great, but it's good enough. Uh, we can move forward a long way 
based on simply what's in the match charting project, even if Hawkeye never gives us any data at all. And it's also a lot cheaper, which is nice. You can help. Go find the match charting project. Those are my websites, heavytopspin.com, Tennis Abstract. 30 contributors, but there's probably like at least three or four people in this room, so you, you guys should help too. And you also start watching tennis a lot more intently. So thanks for listening. That's the advent of actionable tennis analytics. I guess we're open for some questions. Yes. We have time for just two quick questions. You know, talking about baby steps, the, one of the few things I've ever seen a popular book that talks about tennis analytics was uh, scorecasting. And there was a chapter about, you know, at certain, for certain players at certain, against certain opponents, using your second serve, using your first serve as your second serve might be optimal. Has anybody thought or adopted about that in the tour, thinking about those circumstances? It wouldn't require the degree of data that you're looking at, right? It would just be it wouldn't, simple. No, I mean, that's something that comes up occasionally. And Carl, you did something about that, I believe. And, uh, and I think he found that it, it, there are a couple of extreme examples where it might benefit someone, but it's really rare. I don't think anyone's really adopted that as a strategy, but with some, I think it was Ivo Karlovich who it would be effective for. And looking at how Karlovich plays, there's not a huge difference between his tactics on first and second serve. So to some extent, I think he is adopting that. But it, it's, it would be a pretty marginal strategy. And final question over here. Yeah, who do you see paying for a lot of these analytics services? Is it going to be individual players kind of shelling out, shelling out their own individual analytics budget, or do you see it more like federations where they offer it as a service to their members? Um, honestly, I don't see anyone paying for tennis analytics. Um, <laughs> but like I've said before, I, I have my email address up there, so Simona, <laughs> Simona, hi. Um, if you have some extra budget for analytics, yeah, give me a call. Um, yeah, I mean, it could be players. It, it's, it, I mean, think about how baseball teams treated this problem in the, in the very early days. They would just you know, have a consultant who they let be their you know, weird guy in the basement and gave him a part-time consulting, consulting deal. And I mean, I can see that happening with some forward-looking player just deciding, you know, we'll see what happens. Let, let's, let's hire this guy and see what he can come up with. Um, but. I mean, it's a, it's a really traditional game. It's, it, there's very little that's been shown to be effective uh, yet. So it, I think there are some federations that are, are starting to dip their toes in it a little bit. But I, I, much of the stuff I'm talking about here, I, it's a, we're a generation away, at least. Awesome. Please join me in thanking Jeff for his presentation.